Good morning, Firestarters. I'm here with the one and only Holly Burby, also soon to be Holly Hibbert. Yes? Yes. You're getting married. Yes, My emotional are. intelligence queen. What is happening, girl? Tell me what is good in your life. Oh, goodness. What a great question to start with. What is good in my life? Uh, my family is doing really well. Getting married is very exciting. This is my second marriage in my life. And I was single for about, I don't know, seven or eight years before this relationship came to be. So there's that. I have a nine-year-old as a result of this relationship. So I'm getting to finally play mom to a girl, be a mom oh. of a girl. Um, so that's super exciting. Um, this pivot in my career is super exciting of working with parents of teenagers and young adults and the passion being lit up in me. Again, talk about kindling, right? Mm. Um, that has been a feeling that I haven't had for a little bit of a season. So that feels really good too. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I think that's, it's so important what you just said that is, but you are taking the time to listen to those inner whispers and maybe know, okay, perhaps it's time to pivot because we should always feel that sort of excitement, those goosebumps, you know, that when you start talking really fast, because you get so excited about what you're doing. Yes. Sometimes we get too flat. And when I always say, if you're flat, maybe start really asking some tough questions. Perhaps it's time to redirect. So one of the things that I really wanted to talk with you about today is aside from your business, I just really want to know the essence of you, Holly. I see mm -hmm. you on, on, you know, online, on LinkedIn, you do such a great job. You come off as so authentic and I believe you so much when I hear your messages, but what exactly do you stand for and what do you believe in? Mm, thank you so much for that. I, I received that. And I think what I believe in is authenticity. And it's tempting to say I believe in transparency, although mm -hmm. I think there's a distinction to be made between authenticity and transparency. Mm -hmm. Authenticity to me is expressing a point of view, a new perspective. It's new to people because it's my perspective and no one is me. Right. And I think that authenticity, unlike transparency, also requires me to implement boundaries. This is what I am willing to share. This is what I am not willing to share and meeting myself in the middle of how ready am I to deliver this message. So I believe in authenticity. I, and in order for that to happen, I also believe in creating a safe emotional and psychological space for people to show up in that way and be authentic. And so that happens by creating cultures in families and in the workplace where emotional intelligence is honored, encouraged, has, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's revered. It's, it's an aim. It's a goal. Uh, and I think that really sums it up. I think in a, in a nutshell, <laughs> there's so many other things too, compassion, kindness, honesty, passion. And at the root of it, it's, am I really living and expressing authentically who I am, what I believe in and the difference I believe I can make? Yeah. And we were just talking offline a little bit before we got on and we were talking about that disconnect of wanting to come through this way and how sometimes that rawness can uh, maybe put people off, not uncomfortable, but, but I feel I'm a blogger and, and when I blog about things that aren't, I guess, what people are like, why are you sharing your personal <laughs> messiness with us? I said, because from that, I feel like I'm, I'm, my honest self, this is where I'm at. And it's not always unicorns and rainbows. And there are times when I do struggle. So sharing that and putting it on the world and connecting with others, it really helps me. So I'm curious, Holly, you are who you are today, but there's a story there. You didn't just get here. Can you share a little bit about how you got to this point where emotional intelligence, by the way, explain that because that's a very heightened awareness mm. to be in and not only to be mindful of it, but to also coach others on it. Yeah. I th thank you for asking me to define it. Emotional intelligence encompasses different categories of how we interact with others in our life and how we interact with ourselves. And so the categories of emotional intelligence include things like my self-awareness, how much do I notice my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, um, social awareness. What that encompasses is Am I noticing other people's 
thoughts, emotions, and feelings. Emotional intelligence is also how we build and nurture and maintain our relationships. So anything relationship focused is emotional intelligence related. Communication is another facet of emotional intelligence. Do we ask for what we want and what we need? Do we even know what we want and what we need? And the last component of emotional intelligence is decision making. So our ability to trust ourselves to make those decisions that we feel are in the best interest of us and those around us, or our lack of trust in ourselves, or belief that we can make the best decision, that is also tied to our emotional intelligence. So when we think of someone who is in uh, who is seeing a counselor or a therapist, we will refer to mental health and well-being. And I would say that emotional intelligence is more about your emotional wellness and how you navigate the messes and the joys of your emotions. So what what percentage, honestly, do you think are walking around a thinking that they have that high IQ and they don't or otherwise like I feel like this is a, a really a missing component in our society and uh, you must be overbooked. Like, are you just sold out your coaching because this is really needed, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's uh, I'm not sold out yet mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to being sold out with this. I think I agree with you a hundred percent that this is a massive missing piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an elephant in the room and the elephant is invisible. Meaning there's something people are sensing is missing that's keeping us from asking better questions, being curious with people instead of being judgmental with people. How do I communicate with others so that they get my point and my perspective? So I quote, must learn better communication, unquote. People will say these things all the time. The key to a successful relationship is to communicate better. Yes, we've heard it a million times over. And who's teaching it? <laughs> like who's right. teach and that is where I come in. That is where this need has come up is people know they want that elephant. They want to be able to do that thing, but we don't have the language to describe what it is we're looking for. And that is, yeah. So I think the majority of the population is walking around. And I, I also want to make a distinction between someone's IQ and their EQ. Mm. An IQ is our intellectual quotient. It has to do with how academically intelligent that we are. Our EQ is our emotional quotient, and they're not related. Mm -hmm. Something I've discovered by putting content out is when I say emotional intelligence, there is pushback. The same people in one sentence who are saying communication is the key, being kind to one another is the key. In another post, I can say emotional intelligence and the same folks are pushing back and saying, I'm really smart. I should be able to do this. And I'm, I'm, so I have to shake myself and mm -hmm. remind myself, Holly, not everyone knows that your intellectual intelligence and your emotional intelligence, your IQ and your EQ are not the same thing. So we can make ourselves smarter and smarter and more educated in our IQ. But in our emotional quotient, can we implement it? Mm. Do we know how to use it? Do we feel psychologically and emotionally safe enough to practice it? And I want to tell people flat out, if you lack emotional intelligence, it doesn't mean you're dumb. You're, yeah. prob you're probably actually really smart because you are searching for what's that feeling that's in the room that I just can't place my finger on. So true. That that's a really good distinction. Now, what I love what you're doing, and I listen. I am a mom of these a twenty year old and an eighteen year old, mm -hmm. and you are deciding. You are laser focusing now on the youth, Gen Z. Right? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that because I think you're hitting such a sweet spot, and this is such an important conversation. Thank you. I have had a passion in my heart for working with teenagers and young adults mm -hmm. for over 20 years. It actually started when I was still a young adult myself. And long story short, <laughs> uh, my senior year of college, I was supposed to apply to medical school and I caught mono and I missed all my med school interviews and I was bedridden for two months. So I decided in my year before going to med school 
I become I get a teaching certificate. Okay. And lo and behold, the minute I walked into a classroom full of seventh graders and it was loud and chaotic, I fell in love. I loved that there was nothing predictable. Mm. I loved that it was a consistent challenge. I loved watching how these young people worked with one another or didn't. And it was a consistent puzzle of how do I get them to see eye to eye and understand one another, even if they don't relate to one another. And I love that their brains were undeveloped and they simply wanted and needed guidance and structure on how to get those connected pathways in their brain. So I went into teaching and my background is in secondary science education. I taught middle school and high school science for 10 years and left teaching public education in 2014 to pursue coaching because simply I wanted to make a bigger impact using the same mentorship and coaching. And okay. so over the years I've coached on relationships and now I've come full circle as I've shifted in my life from the single life and helping single people and marital issues and helping people work through that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm back to being a family woman because of my own personal life and my marriage and my, my nine-year-old. And my heart is now back to young people. I have always believed that being with teenagers and young adults, the number one thing that I brought to the classroom was my ability to see them as people. Mm -hmm not only a young person, but see them as a person, not my student, not someone I am in charge of, although that was true also. And I had parents who would come to me when I was a classroom teacher and they would say through email or at conferences, I need your advice. And they would run something by me that's happening at home. And I would stop them and say, you know, I was 26 years old at the time. <laughs> and I would say to them, you know, I'm not a mother right? Like I am a teacher, but I'm not a mother. And they would say to me, yes, but we trust you because my kid loves you. My kid respects you. And you have 150 of them a day. Mm. And I have one and I can't handle it. So help me. So I've had apparently a secret sauce this whole time of being able to work with young people in a way that I'm not trying to be cool mom status or anything right. like that. I'm just keeping it very practical of non-judgment, very open-minded, very welcoming, and again, emotional and psychological safety, letting them know that they have permission to explore their thoughts, feelings, and emotions in my presence, in my classroom, mm. have lunch with me on my lunch break when I was a teacher. Even if it was just to sit there and they could sit and be in silence and have some peace and quiet, and I wasn't going to be badgering them or questioning or asking why. And I really feel that, you know, and those were millennials I was teaching. Now with Gen Z, who currently are between the ages of 11 and 26, because especially of lockdown and pandemic, yes, we have become aware of the academic slide and how that has impacted and put a lot of students academically behind. But the emotional impact, I feel, has gotten less attention. And now that we're almost three years out from that happening, I am afraid that parents and educators, um, yeah, they might have it in their face day to day, but I think it can be so easy to allow the world and the narrative to tell us everything's fine. Everything's back to normal. Right. Just go. And they don't have a, quote, normal to go back to. So that's where I come in. And that's why I'm so passionate about this work. Oh, it's so needed. And I agree with you. I, I see it with my own boys. Um, they do lack something uh, of as much as I try to work with them. The reality is that they hide behind their phones and they do not know how to interact in the world face to face, human to human. It, it is something that is missing. And it's maybe they're not in touch with their feelings. They're not, I'm not, I'm just glad you're there and you're <laughs> going to sort it out because it's needed. So bravo to you. Thank you. So uh, one of the things um, here that we're trying to do here at the Kindling Project, it was really, we want to inspire women. We want to ignite a little passion project. And so many women uh, we feel are just really going through the motions and not really fully living their fullest selves. And when we say this, I'm always careful because I am never disrespecting women who, who are deciding that they are stay at home moms. I think that's a beautiful thing. I have never want people to, um, you know, 
to get divorced and leave, nothing crazy. I'm always just asking, can we stop to ask, can we add ourselves to the very long to-do list and add ourselves to that and say, what is it that I want? What is it that I need? How do I want to feel today? And just answering those questions to ignite that little passion that perhaps lies in you. So hmm. what do you say to women? Holly, as you are navigating through, and a lot of these moms you're working with now is what, what do you think that they need to hear? First of all, I think that it's important that women start to give verbal permission slip to one another mm -hmm. to talk about what we need and what we want. It is okay to say, this is what I need in the moment. This is what I want in the moment. And unfortunately, societally, Women have played such a strong force and at times have had to sacrifice that strong, the, the softer persona that has needs and has wants in order to put forward this persona of strength. I have it under control. Everything is great. Don't let them see you cry. Mm -hmm. All of the things. It's almost, well, okay. So that's the first thing is to give permission to other women to talk about what they need and what they want. And the easiest way to do that is in our everyday conversations, ask each other, mm. what do you need right now? What do you want right now? I cannot even begin to describe the number of times I have had hardships in the last couple of years. And two of my closest girlfriends, when I go to them and open up and vent about something, they will consistently ask me, and I do the same for them, what do you need right now? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is a question that I can answer right away because I've thought about it, but most of the time it checks me right out of those emotions for a moment and has me answer the question for myself. And it stops that internal cycle and dialogue of, help, I'm stuck, I'm frustrated, I'm sad, I don't know what to do, I'm incapable, whatever the thoughts are internally. So that's, that's the first component is asking each other that. And the second thing I would say is for us as women to become more skilled than ever in our vocabulary we use to describe our thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions. This is what's going to help us raise our young people. This is what's going to help us in our relationships. So here's what I mean by knowing your vocabulary when it comes to emotions. Brene Brown put a great book out less than two years ago called Atlas of the Heart. And Atlas of the Heart serves as a reference book that describes uh, different vocabulary that we can be using to talk about how I feel, what I want, what I need, how I'm thinking. And oftentimes people can be asked, how do you feel about something? And they say, I don't know. It's not that they don't know. It's that they don't have the words for it. Mm -hmm. And so in her book, she talks about research shows the majority of people only describe their emotions as happy, sad, or angry. And it's not because they only experience happiness, sadness, and anger. It's because they don't have the words for it. So part of my mission is to increase that emotional literacy. So in her book, she lays out term by term, what does it mean to experience sadness or to experience joy or elation as compared to happiness? And those 72 common terms that are used in therapy and counseling sessions, that's a good place to start increasing the vocabulary. And when we are with our young people, with our family, and we ask someone, how do you feel? What do you want? What do you need? And they go, I don't know. Maybe a great backup question is, do you think you don't know or do you think you just don't know the word for it? And when I ask my teenage clients that, and when I ask their moms or some dads mm -hmm. that question, nine times out of 10, it's, I don't have the word for it. So I ask them to try to describe it using some other sensory. I will ask them something like, well, what do you think it looks like? the feeling that you're feeling. So focus on the sight. What do you think it sounds like? Oh, it sounds like a freight train. It sounds like a river that's going over a waterfall. <laughs> what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like in your body? So I try to give them other ways in their senses okay. to describe the feeling. 
I love that. I love that. I feel like what you just said it, I, my next question was like, how can we use emotional intelligence to find our purpose? You just told mm. me, it's like, have the vocabulary. Because if we don't, if we can't start there, we can't mm. start putting it into words, into action. Mm -hmm. So that's really beautiful. Now, um, so if you could leave like uh, our listeners with a little nugget of wisdom, like one piece that what everyone's going to remember you for, for, our, for the ladies listening, what, what is it? I had one ready to go and now I need to give two and it's going to be really quick. I promise. Go. Number one, purpose and calling are not the same thing. If you are searching for your purpose, sometimes purpose can feel so big because purpose is why are you here living the life that you are living? What is that? However, we are all evolving individuals every single time. Some Mm -hmm. of us are not the same person we were six months ago, six years ago, six decades ago. And so give yourself permission to keep uncovering your purpose and know that with every season of your life, you're calling in a different season. You're calling the way you express your purpose may look different. But at the, at the root of it, your purpose will be a seamless string all the way. So mm-hmm. focus on the calling of the season. And the second piece of advice I would give is to trust yourself that you are more resourceful than you think. You are intelligent enough to look it up and Google it. You mm-hmm. are resourceful enough to meet the people you need to meet to get the advice that you need to get. It is all out there waiting for you to go discover it. And you are fully capable of seeking out and receiving the help, support, advice that you need to nail down your season's calling and take an action step. Oh, I love that. I love that because for so many of our listeners and so many, so much of the feedback, we get like, well, we don't even know where to start. Well, we don't know how to do this. But you just said is like, we mm. all do have the power. And as simple as the, what's your point, like Google it, you can start. It's all there and for the taking. So mm-hmm. that's really incredible. Now, give me a little bit more about um, your world, Holly, as far as emotional intelligence. What have you also discovered in your teaching? that is absolutely worth sharing? When it comes to emotional intelligence, I would say that first I've discovered that as a woman, I don't give myself enough credit for how much knowledge I have about this subject. Okay. And I point that out because I think it's something that maybe other women might relate to. You you as an expert in whatever it is you are passionate about, you have the ability to teach someone who needs to be pulled up to your level. You don't have to be the expert. You don't have to be the guru. And that is part of emotional intelligence. That is part of my self-awareness. Here's what I know for certain. Here are the tools I'm aware of and I feel comfortable with. And also it's part of emotional intelligence because it's part of social awareness Mm -hmm. where I can look around and say, okay, I'm just looking to serve someone who is a step behind me and I'm capable of supporting them up the one step. It doesn't have to be about saving the entire planet in one fell swoop, although I'm excited to to do that too. But I've learned that I can look around the world and stop assuming that everyone knows as much as I do. This is something that I am joyfully obsessed with, emotional intelligence and relationships and communication and people and young people. And not everyone has that. And that's one of my gifts. And that's something I think people can also use to discover their purpose. What are you joyfully obsessed with? I love that. Joyfully obsessed with. Uh, The name of my blog uh, is To Get Her Joy for that Mm -hmm. reason. Because I think that's that's where it lies in that joy, the joyous of it all. So um, personally for you, what what brings you pride and satisfaction and what brings you pure, pure joy beyond connecting with people? Mm, Organizing. (laughs) Organizing. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Decluttering and organizing brings me a level of freedom that feels so nice and I can breathe. Something I've learned in my, in my world and in my profession is that women, our environment talks to us. Because we were at one point prehistorically gatherers in the Mm -hmm. meadow. 
And as women gatherers in the meadow, we had to pay attention to every single detail that was there. Because if we didn't, we could pick the wrong food and feed it to our family. And the wrong food literally would be life or death for our family. So it is in our DNA for our environment to talk to us. And a tidier environment, a less cluttered environment, and an organized environment, and my thoughts too, decluttering my thoughts, organizing my thoughts, that brings me more clarity. That brings me more creativity. It kind of like takes the meadow and cleans out the meadow. So the only thing that's left is the stuff that I can pick, feed to myself, feed to my family, and thrive on. So I, I love that level of emotional freedom I feel through organization. That's fantastic. Um, you know, we had a uh, Stephanie Porter on early on the podcast and she uh, does this for people. She declutters people's homes and, and she do- talked about that, that part of her job on to her was therapy because through decluttering, you do get um, a sense of, to your point, of ease. Like you just breathe a little bit easier. So I, I love what you're saying. I, and I love how you are tied it back to our like back in the day, like our innateness of needing mm-hmm. that. That's, and, and isn't it Oprah Winfrey always says we, we are what our space is, meaning like mm. it should really speak to us. And so it represents our lives in many ways. It's very interesting. And let me ask you, though, what personally frustrates you? Or do you get bored by or are you unfulfilled by? Mm. Well, full transparency and disclosure, Mm -hmm. I have ADHD. Okay. I was diagnosed ADHD as an adult. And I bring this up because there are seven different types of it. And the type that I am is inattentive. And so focus is something I have to work tirelessly on. I have to have my environment be set up so that I can focus the best. I also, as a result of the way my brain is set up, this is not a deficit. This is just my brain is set up differently as a neurodivergent person. Um, So for me to focus takes an immense amount of effort, organization of my time, organization of my environment, setting myself up to win. And what frustrates me (laughs) is when I don't have enough time to plan the things I need to, or I feel like I have fallen short in some way for my family or for work or for my kid or my spouse, et cetera, um, because of the difficultness it is for me to, to focus at times. So that gets very frustrating and I'm consistently working on understanding my neurodivergent brain um, and finding ways to get all the knowledge in the back of my head to in the back of my brain to then be used by the part in the front of my brain, because that's what neurodivergence is. The knowledge in the back of the brain uh-huh. and the usage of it in the front, they don't talk. So, so I can be super, super smart, but it's difficult and frustrating because I feel like sometimes I'm trying to hit the button that says, yes, do this. Uh-huh. Yes, do this. But I hit yes. And the no lights up. And I'm like, no, that's not what I wanted. And I, I, I have to work around it. So that can get very frustrating because I'm so motivated and so creative that I need my brain to keep up with me. Yeah. Is, do you have a, a specific hack that helps you? Are you like a time blocker or how do you organize your time to, to be able to do this? I have actually found a YouTube channel that uses what's called the Pomodoro method. It's a method of studying. And all it is is a YouTube channel that plays music and has a little timer on the screen. Okay. But the Pomodoro method for studying, and this might support any of you listening who have young people in your home or you yourself have some form of ADD, ADHD, autism. Um, it's basically 30 minutes on and a 10 minute break or 20 minutes on and a five minute break. And so the YouTube channel just plays relaxing sounds in the background. And when the timer goes off, I stop, I get up, I go take a break and come back. And I have to remind myself that those breaks are necessary to let my brain reset and breathe because it's very easy for me just to charge right through. Mm. But I know that that makes my brain more exhausted. And I'm trying to, this is one of my ways of decluttering it, letting it breathe. 
That's really uh, that's really good uh, feedback. I'm going to link that. That's an interesting uh, way to study. I like that. Tell me something, Holly. What uh, what do you want to be known most for in this world? Healing families through compassion, kindness, and understanding. Mm. That's beautiful. And you're that's, doing it. Thank you. Mm. It's uh, that is the purpose. That's never changed. And the callings have been. I did it as a middle school teacher. I did it as a high school teacher. I did it as an Olympic style weightlifting coach. I did it as a leadership development trainer. Now I'm doing this. I did it as a relationship coach. Now I'm working with young adults and their moms and teens. This calling has changed over and over again as I have grown. And the purpose is still the same. That's to heal families. Yeah. What? When did you really know this though? Do you remember? Like was was it a young age that you this was just who you are? Like it's just who you are. That's a great way to put it. It's not that I had an epiphany moment of I want to heal families and that's why I'm here. However, when I hear you say it in that way, this is just who I am. I think it has always been my nature to be a peacemaker, a peacekeeper, an open individual. And it stems from a childhood where my mom raised my brother and I pretty much on her own. And uh, my parents split when I was three and my brother was one. So my mom being all the roles all the time, there was a lot of tumultuous moments growing up um, with her doing the best she can, but a very stressed out woman, very stressed out for obvious reasons. And it created a lot of unrest in the home. And it forced us as a family over the years to learn how to talk to one another, how to understand one another, how to be curious instead of judgmental with one another. So it is inherently who I am because of how I grew up. But I didn't have words for that to describe it in this way until later in life. Um. But I'm curious as as you navigate through this world and, and you have such high emotional intelligence, it's exhausting too though, isn't it, Holly? Because you're constantly giving. You're so patient. You're the one that's listening. You're the one that's, you know, taking the words and connecting it for people and you're helping them see things. And you're constantly holding the mirror up for others to see themselves and to um help and improve. What about you? What mm. what do you do for yourself to fill that void? You know that who fills you up? That's a really great question. Mm -hmm. I think it's partly myself and my own habits, and it's partly the people in my life that fill me up. And for many years, I think I created bitterness or resentment because I expected the others in my life to help me feel better first. I didn't recognize that as unhealed codependency for a very long mm -hmm. time. But once I recognized what it was and made the commitment to myself that I must find ways and have routines in my life where I am committed to nurturing my mind and my soul and replenishing myself for a moment in an easy, realistic way, then things became smoother. So how I do that now is when I am taking clients and helping people and supporting them, I do structure my time where I have breaks between calls. Or for example, I will take clients all day long on a Tuesday, which I call a peopling day. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but then Wednesday will be a non-peopling day. That okay. will be a day where I will not book meetings. I won't you know, I'll do what I have to do for my family, mm -hmm. but I'm not in taking other people's life because I need to allow myself to reset. Uh, I think what I'm hearing you say is that, yes, you give, but when you, when you reset, you go inward and it's all those feelings, you're still controlling, you're navigating, you're not looking for other people to fill your bucket, you're filling your own bucket. And I think that's so important to decipher because so many people are out there are to your point, are walking around like resentful, angry, like, why aren't they doing for me? And why are they? Why are they making me feel this way? And I'm so quickly learning that. Why are we giving our feelings away to someone else? We control our feelings, right? Like, um, this past few weeks, I've had sort of a tough time with community members. And I felt like, how is it that I'm letting them steal my joy and letting them control how I feel? No, 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 no. 
I get to control how I feel. Really, I can't, their opinions or feelings are none of my business. Mm -hmm. You know, they can but so it's such a normal thing to do, right? To let them infiltrate you and get in your head and all of a sudden you're acting and doing based on others, which makes no sense. I want to add to this. Oh yeah, go ahead. ahead. No, I was just saying intellectually, I know this about, I know the difference emotionally though. That's where you, someone like you comes in. It's like, can I self-regulate and cut that off faster? And now that's all I'm working on. They still pop up. It's like, can I cancel that thought and move on? Before Mm -hmm. I used to let it linger and linger and linger, right? Brilliant. Mm -hmm. So brilliant and so well said because I have found the same thing. I I literally woke up this morning and somebody replied to a Facebook story telling me that they feel like I'm talking down to them and they're going to unfriend me now. This is an actual real life friend. That's not the way I want to start my day. Right, (laughs) right. After I had already done all of my mindset work and the Mm. things that I do to take care of myself. And then I finally sit down to start to work and boom, there it is. And I'm like, no, (laughs) like, but your point about self-regulating faster, Mm -hmm. that is a win. And I think we, it's in, or instead of expecting us to be able to self-regulate every single time, if we can look back over the last one year, let's say, and say, yes, I've become more adept, more skilled at more efficiently quieting down, coming to my senses, becoming self-aware, handling my emotions in the moment. That is a win. And I also want to put a disclaimer on what you and I are talking about in this moment, because there are going to be people that will hear you and I talk about this and say, yeah, but that person Like, yeah, for real, I know my emotions and I can handle it, but they really don't step up. They Mm -hmm. really don't do anything. You know, Monica nor I, I imagine everyone, we're not Mm -hmm. here to negate people in your life and and, and say that they are, you know, that what you're saying is not true about them. It could very well be true that that person is not standing up for it. But it's important to, yes, demand personal responsibility from them for their actions and their way that they express. But we also have to be responsible for Mm -hmm. our emotions, how we express ourselves. It's not fair to ask of others what we will not ask of ourselves. Amen, sister. You said it. There you go. Well, listen, Holly, I could talk to you forever and I'm <laughs> definitely going to have you back because I feel like we just barely touch on things. I mean, one, in, I could sit and talk with, with just one of your responses. I could spend hours and hours <laughs> unpacking. So thank you so much for have, for being here and shedding some of your wisdom with us. But before we take off, please tell people, how can they work with you? Where do they find you? Thank you for having me. This has been, oh my gosh, I'm excited to come back and do more. Yes. The easiest way to get in touch with me is through my website, hollyburby.com forward slash connect. Okay. That was going to take them to part of my website that has all of my links to Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. I have made thousands of videos, short form, long form over the years. Also, it will also guide them to my free Facebook group for parents of teens and young adults called the Holly Burby Podcast Insiders. And also by going to that page, they can download a free gift that I've created. It's a PDF download called 10 ways to help your teenager build resilience and emotional intelligence. I need that. Not that that anyone needs that. Yeah. (laughs) Hello. Yeah. Hollyburby.com forward slash connect. It's just the spelling of my name. Okay. That is great. And we're going to put everything on the show notes for sure. And Holly, before we take off, we uh, like to never, we'd like to sign up the show with a final shout out to anyone who has kindled your fire this week. Um, so go at it. Mm, my best friend in the world, Nicole Herman, has been a sounding board for me. That has been great. My friend Dana Thomas, she has been great. Those are the people that ask me consistently, what do you need and what do you want? So they have kindled the fire and reminded me that I'm doing the best I can with what I have and that it is enough. That has been very, very supportive to hear that from other human beings. That's beautiful. Okay. Well, my shout out this week is to you, Holly. I mean, it's been, I don't do this all the time. I'm going to tell you, but you've really said some things that really resonated with me. And I I just feel like the work you're doing with teenagers is so important and so critical. Mamas out there, 
look up Holly. Girls, you know we need this help. Don't even try to pretend we don't because we do. It takes a community, it takes a village, and you are leading the way. So I really appreciate the work you're doing. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I, and I received that and I look forward to supporting anyone however I can. Okay, great. Well, ladies, remember, it only takes one spark to ignite the fire within. And until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.